from Criterion Games, and he's going to be talking to you about internships and personal projects. So over to you, Adam. Perfect. Uh, how are you guys doing? You all right? Good conference? Nice. So, yeah, I wanted to do this um, talk because when I was at university, there was, there was kind of, I saw things about, you know, placement projects or no placements and stuff like that and internships, but I was like, uh, it's, it's not really worth my time. I kind of want to do my three years here at university and, you know, crack on, get a job and do that kind of stuff. But really, uh, well, someone pushed me in to do uh, an internship and it was probably you know, like a life-changing thing, sounds really corny, but it's now sort, sorted me out with a career and things like that. So I wanted to sort of be an advocate for uh, internships. Um, but this, this uh, talk is kind of like a two-parter. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how good internships are and what's sort of the good stuff about them, if you're not really aware. I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory, but we might as well go over it. And then I'm also going to talk about some um, stuff about sort of personal projects and portfolio stuff. So, because um, it's all well and good saying, yeah, go for internships and stuff, but if you, you, know, if you don't have the, the CV or the, the portfolio to back that up, then it's gonna be difficult to get one. So, yeah. Uh, so, oh good, that did work. Uh, my name is Adam Pierce. I'm a software engineer at Criterion. Um, here is a cute picture of my dog. He hasn't done an internship, no relevance to the talk, I just, I want to show a cute picture of my dog. Um, so I actually started off as a, uh, a 2D artist um, for Flash games um, about 10 years ago. Um, it was when mobile was sort of rising up and it wasn't really a thing. Um, I'll happily talk to anyone about why Flash games and Flash is generally like the most influential thing to happen to the indie scene for a long time and why it's really, really cool, but that's probably another talk and a, and a conversation down at the pub. Um, so, yeah, I uh, joined Criterion as an intern. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was during my second and third year at university. So I did my first two years at uni, then I did a placement year and went back and did my third. Um, so hopefully you guys know who Criterion are. Um, they've been around for a while. Um, they're most known for the Burnout series, you know, Burnout 1, 2, and 3. Um, <laughs> the guy over there. Uh, Burnout Paradise recently got remastered. Um, they're great games, um, but they also have sort of done different things recently. So they've done the Need for Speed um, series. We did Hot Pursuit and Most Wanted. And then um, recently we helped on Need for Speed 2016, not the most recent one, but the one just before that. And then since I've joined, um, we've kind of been branching off into less sort of arcade races and more sort of different stuff. So um, as you can see, like uh, we did um, the, all the vehicles on Battlefield 1, which is pretty cool and exciting. Um, we did the speeder bike mission in Battlefront 1, confusing names. Uh, Battlefield, Battlefront, Star Wars Battlefront 1, we did the, the speeder mission, which was really awesome. Um, and then we got the chance to work on uh, the Star Wars VR project. So if anyone has a PSVR, I definitely recommend playing it. It's really cool. Um, so that was, yeah, like a six month to a year project where we made Star Wars in VR. That's probably my favorite thing that we've made because we worked pretty close and we managed to do a lot of cool stuff with the X-Wings and things like that. So, um, and then most recently we did uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2. Please don't talk to me about loot boxes. Uh, <laughs> I'll just ignore you if you do. No, uh, that was an awesome project. We did um, the Starfighter Assault, which is all the, basically all the vehicle missions, um, and then all the arcade mode as well, which is what I mainly did. So that's, uh, working on Star Wars is kind of, a dream for most people, so it was kind of nice to do. Um, and now, most recently, working on Battlefield Five um, Firestorm, which is the Battlefield um, Battle Royale. Uh, I can't talk about that, so please don't come and talk to me about it. Sadly, um, yes. So uh, internships—that's what I'm here to talk about. So yeah, like I said, I wasn't super fussed about internships, placement years, whatever. I was like, yeah, whatever, I'll just, I'll just crack on and do, do my thing. Um, but then uh, someone close to me said, you know what, you should really go for it. I know someone in the industry or, you know, like 
have a chat with them and see if, if it's an industry you want to go for. Um, and really, yeah, it's, that has been the start of me just being in, in the games industry, which is awesome. And at the, like, I've never, haven't really worked a day in my life. Like, it's super fun. And I, I, going into work doesn't feel like, you know, the daily grind. Um, it's, it's basically what I wanted to do from when I was tiny. So, yes. Um, so I'll just go through a couple of points as to why internships are really good. Um, so the first one, and this is probably the most important one, is that it gives context. So um, when I was at uni, I was like, okay, yeah, I understand a lot of stuff that I'm learning. I'm, I'm understanding the data structure. I, so I'm a programmer, so it was, I did computer science. So it was like, yeah, data structures and algorithms. I get what they are and what they do, but until you actually put them in place and put them to use, it's really difficult to sort of fit everything together. So um, for example, like I learned what an A star pathfinding algorithm was, but until I joined Criterion and had to use it for the AI, and it turns out it's the most you know, common algorithm used for AI, it made a whole, more, whole lot more sense for me. Um, things like data structures being the difference between 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second, and 90 frames per second. Um, which you need for VR, which is a pain. But yeah, so giving context is really awesome. And it's kind of just the, the main reason. It's kind of, uni projects are great. And they, they like, uh, they give you an example of what you have to do. But until you kind of uh, have to work together with other people, it's really difficult for you to um, see where all these pieces put together. Um, so it also looks great on a CV. This one's kind of an obvious one, but um, as soon as an employee or someone sees that you've done a year's worth of experience, or even six months, or whatever it is, um, it's just gonna—they're just gonna—it's gonna make you pop in, in all the applications that come out, and you can—and uh, yeah, it's gonna give you a better chance of doing getting the job. Um, it ought, like doing an internship also. Basically, as soon as you do it, you, you, become, you become a dev, right? So you'll, you'll learn all the lingo, you'll start like picking up the language, and, and that stuff, like employees pick up that stuff when you start talking about builds and you start talking about processes and things like that. They're gonna pick that kind of stuff up. So having that experience is, is really good. Um, this is a bonus, but you probably should get paid for it. If you're not getting paid for it, it's probably a rubbish internship, but uh, yeah. Everyone likes a bit of cash, and especially when you're at university, um, having a bit, having a break between not not really being able to work properly and then having a year where you're work, essentially working full time, it's not a huge amount of money. It's probably not going to be for an internship, but at least it will. Like I managed to save a ton of money in my internship and come back for my third year, and then I didn't have to work, which was really nice. And then I could focus on my final year project and things like that. So it's. You know, it's, that's, that's a nice bonus. And then lastly, um, it can kind of be done at any time. So it doesn't ha you don't have to do an internship during your th second and third year. Um, you, it's, you, you do get the chance to as a placement year, I think. And I did look up on Staffordshire Uni, and they do have that kind of stuff. But also, like, so for example, Criterion has hired six interns this year, um, and I think two out of those people are doing their master's degree. So they're like midway through their master's degree. So it's not, you don't have to be at the right time in the right place if you fancy doing it afterwards or if you want to further your education, you're not gonna miss your chance on doing an internship. So it's all kind of good and well for me going, yeah, internships are super good and I'm like, you should definitely do them, but you need to get them, right? It's, it's, it's like going for a job, it's not, it's not like you just walk up to someone and just go, yeah, give me an internship. And they're like, yeah, that's cool, all right, come in. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's basically like getting a job. And so a lot of these principles that I'm going to go through uh, apply to just getting graduate jobs as well, which is kind of nice. Um, so yeah, the, the, thing, the key, I think, to um, being a, a hireable person or someone who can be hired is like having a decent portfolio. 
So I think it's even, I feel like it's even more important than having a nice CV, like having experience and stuff, because you can, employees can read your, like, you know, where you've worked and things like that, but actually having something tangible to look at and read or play or whatever is, is worth a thousand words. So um, it does sound quite dull and boring, but having a portfolio is super important. Um, and it really gives you guys a chance to explore what you like and what you don't like. Um, I feel like uh, having your uni projects and stuff in your portfolios is great, but um, most of the time uni projects are super limited because you're, you're under time pressure. They're, they need to be marked as well, so you know it's under a very strict brief, but, you sh but they're, they're not really expressing who you are and what you want to do. So having the chance to bolster your portfolio and do other things is a really a chance to show your employer what you like doing and not what your course is about. Um, so yeah, they give you a chance to sort of express your creative side um, and that's what the games industry is really all about. Like even if you're a programmer, you're still being super creative every day. Like as a programmer, I, you know, they have to find really creative solutions to different problems um, all the time, and it's it's not often that I don't go on like on a day basis without having to help with the design or something like that. So it's all about being creative, and um, it also gives your employees a chance to see how kind of passionate as as a games developer that you want to be. Um, the games industry is super full of super passionate people, but, um, but that doesn't mean you have to be like confident and bubbly and like, yeah, I'm like, I love games all the time. It just means you have to get excited by making games, like digging deep into like a design floor or something like that, or, you know, oh yeah, I really love this character that I made. Um, so, okay, what do I mean by portfolio? This is kind of embarrassing, but this is my old, um, Portfolio. This is what I used to show um, game studios when I was looking for a job. Like I said, Flash Games this doesn't look good. Anyway, so yeah, like the top left one, that was a game where you had to eat food that came flying across the screen, and if you didn't chew in time, you would throw up. Um, <laughs> like that, that one there, the, the dinosaur one, you would have to rampage through the city and uh, and squash people. Like. These aren't super shiny and they're not like, oh, they're the most amazing thing. You probably only want to play them for about five minutes, but uh, it's good to give you guys a bit of context on what I'm talking about with the, with the portfolio. Um, and it doesn't have to be games, like it can be a collection of, of anything. Like uh, if you're, you know, if, if you want to just come up with a load of different game designs or if you're an environment artist, create a load of different environments or, you know, a character model that maybe you've animated. But really, a portfolio just needs to be a collection of things that you, you want to make. Um, so it's basically there to show you what you can do. Um, so, yeah, uh, I have come up with a, a few guidelines because ultimately your time is super important. Uh, most of you are at university or, you know, working or whatever, and you don't have thousands and thousands of hours to spend on bolstering portfolio, making sure it's like up to date and things like that. Um, as a programmer, I kind of like to do things efficiently, and over, I think I spent, you know, at least two or three years making my portfolio, um, and I made a lot of mistakes and wasted a ton of time, and I figured it would be nice for you guys to know those mistakes so you don't have to do them too. So uh, rule number one is try everything twice. Um, so you, you don't really know what you like until you try it. Um, and in the games industry, there is a ton of stuff to do. Like no matter whether it's like art or code or design, which is like three main six sections, there's still like outside of there like QA and a bunch of other things. But even within those sections, there is a broad stuff a broad amount of stuff for you guys to do. Um, and 
like whether you want to be a jack of all trades, so try out a ton of different things, um, which tends to lend itself to more indie studio kind of stuff, or you want to become a specialist and deep dive into like a specific thing, um, which again is more AAA, but both of those kind of styles of knowledge, I guess, um, lend themselves to, to the games industry. Um, so yeah, I would highly recommend everyone just give everything a go that you possibly can. There are so many tools and so many tutorials out there that like when I was learning, I would struggle to find decent tutorials and I would struggle to find like, oh, I really want to learn how to program or whatever, but it would just be super gnarly problems and things like that. But now you have like tools like Unity, like Unity and Unreal 4 are like free. So you can just pick them up and make games in them, you know, today. Um, and there's just a ton of people making tutorials and content out there where you can pick it up. You can literally, if you've got a free afternoon, go, okay, today I want to learn shaders. And you find a tutorial online and, and go through shaders. If, if you don't like it, then that's not a problem. At least you've learned something. And at least you're like, okay, I, I now understand how this thing works. And then in the sort of, when you do get into the industry, you have that breadth of knowledge where at least you can make sort of more um, contextual decisions because you're like, oh, I understand vaguely how shaders work, so I can go, yeah, all right, let's make this decision instead of that one. Um, and plus it gives you a chance to find your, like, your true passion, like what you actually like doing. Because it's so broad, the chances of you sort of saying, oh yeah, I found exactly what I like doing, it's shader programming. That's going to be super slim. You're going to have to try out a few things before you do that. So ultimately, your, your best work is going to be something that you're passionate about and what, you're, what you really like doing. So you might as well find that sooner rather than later. Um, the second one is start and probably stay simple. Um, my, like, one of my favorite things is people coming up to me and go, look, I really want to make an 150 hour long MMO RPG in the next week. Can you help me out? And I'm like, God, okay, well, I don't even know how, like, I'm in the game industry, I don't even know how to start doing that. So the, the idea is that you should probably give yourself clear goals on what, what you want to make and what you want to do in your portfolio, because you're actually more likely to finish something that way. Uh, and when a prospective employee or whatever is looking at your portfolio, they're going to go, they're not going to look at something that's half finished and barely runs, or, you know, some half-finished model and go, oh, yeah, it looks fantastic. But if you give it time and you have a, a sort of a small chunk of something that you've made that's quite highly polished and highly finished, they're going to go, yeah, that looks great. Like, I would say it's better to finish things through than it is to start a load of different things. So start something, finish it, move on to the next thing. And just understand what you're, what you're trying to make. Don't, if you're going to make a small game, understand what you're exploring there. Don't just sort of walk in to the ether. Um, I know it sounds a bit like planning, and no one really likes planning, but just a little bit. Um, just FYI, this rule applies to game jams, too. The most successful game jams I've ever seen are just one that relies on a simple concept and doesn't go too crazy. Um, so yeah, number three, play games. Super hard. That's really difficult. Um, but what I don't mean is go and play thousands and thousands of hours of League of Legends. It's totally cool to have like your favorite game, and yeah, I do this a lot where I just go back to my favorite game, but push yourself to go and try something new. It kind of relates to point one, but it's like without knowing what's out there, you're not going to know what to make. Like there is inspiration everywhere for games, whether it be mobile, console, PC, AAA, indie. I mean, indie has a huge amount of stuff going for it. And like, so sort of get out there and play, play a lot of games. I mean, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory, but some people do fall flat on that. Um, and ultimately, ideas come from anywhere. So yeah, play a lot of games. It's easy one. Um, number four is pick your own battles. So you don't have to make everything from scratch. Uh, I spent a lot of time when I was trying to like develop my portfolio where I was like, 
okay, I have to be um, a super original person. I have to make everything. Like, I want to be legit. So, you know, I'm going to do the art. I'm going to do the code. I'm going to do everything. And actually, that's, that's not really how it works. Like, um, even in the industry, people kind of, they use a lot of other stuff. It's not, not stealing because that's taking credit, but like concept artists, they photo bash all the time where they take photos and just stick it all together to make a, a cool concept. And, you know, programmers, they take different libraries and put them together and make sure they work together and things like that. It's like you should, when you're making a, a, pro, a small project or something, understand why you're trying to make that, like what you're exploring. So if you're a programmer, there's no real point in you spending hours and hours on art, unless you want to, and that's totally fine. But if it's quicker for you to go, boom, grabbed a 3D model off the internet, and now you've got you know, an animated character walking around, and it sells what you're trying to get through a lot more, then that's a win. So yeah, don't try and do everything, um, because no one's expecting you to be a one-man studio. I know there's a lot of like um, super inspiring stories out there of indie developers, but for every one developer that's made a game and they've spent you know years making that game, there are probably hundreds of people who have tried that and failed, and that's fine too. Um, but I think the the main important thing about this is, is just don't lie about what you're using. So be brutally honest about okay, I made all the code here but all the art is not mine. And so in your portfolio, just make sure that you, you reference everything that you've made, because that's, that's super important. And if an employee even has a, like a small whiff of you kind of trying to take credit where credit's not due, then that will be it. You, that'll be your CV straight out the door. So yeah, be honest about it. This is nice for programmers especially, because art is, there's loads of stuff online where you can just sort of grab and go. Um, but it's the same for artists as well, where you can grab a, um, like a little prototype or something, like, like a free source game that someone's made and reskin it. That's, that's worth doing because you show that you have art skills going on there because that's what you're going to do in the industry. Um, so last one is uh, learn to present yourself and your portfolio. So... You could be the most amazing designer, the most amazing programmer, whatever, but unless you can convey your ideas and what you're all about, then no one's really going to pay attention to you. Um, like, employees probably get a lot of applications, and unless you stand out from the get-go, then it's, you know, you're probably not going to get the job. Um, so. There's a few things that you can do here to make this easy. Um, so your portfolio should be kind of easily accessible. So no one wants to have to go through, you know, they're like click on a link, download a zip file, enter the password, then install an XE and all that stuff. No one, like no one's going to do that. And if you, the more barriers to entry of showing off what you can do to an employee that the less chance that they're actually going to give you the time and go for it. Um, so it should be easily accessible. Whether it's just you know, one printed A3 piece of paper, or it's just a quick link, you know, an easy link that they can follow through, I think the idea here is that like, you should, everything should come out straight away as what you want to be. So like, it should be easily seen straight away. But then if they want to click through further, if you, they're actually interested in you, then you should give them the opportunity to. Um, it should be readable as well. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a programmer or it doesn't matter if you have the worst art skills in the world. Um, with like the internet at the moment, you can, it's, it's super easy for you to just Google um, like, okay, typography or graphic design. And there are a ton of resources out there where you can go, here are five simple rules for you to follow which are going to make your portfolio pop and actually be consistent and look good. And it's, it's, it's kind of, it's easy for me to say it, but like there, there are some very basic things like 
not using 15 fonts. I've seen that happen a lot of times. Comic Sans, stay away from that. Everyone knows that one. But you know, it's just, it's just small things like that where you can, that you can save yourself the hassle of trying to redesign, you know, make it become a graphic designer when that's not what you're trying to be. Um, and again, just be honest on your portfolio. Don't, don't try and show, you know, I made this AAA game over here. That's just not going to work. Um, and lastly, this is kind of a bonus one, but uh, appreciate and value your time and well-being. So this is like a, a super topical thing that's happening in the games industry now with Red Dead and stuff like that coming out. But um, sadly, no one's going to pay you for your portfolio in the short term. Um, it takes a lot of investment, um, and it's usually done in tandem to like uni work and, and things like that, and it is difficult. But it's usually worth it, and it's usually worth getting yourself all of the things that make you a hireable person and getting it together and pushing it out to all the, all the employees that you kind of want to be with. Um, but no one's going to employ someone who's burnt out already. Like, uh, the m it's not going to be worth getting a job if you're, you know, already burnt out from spending thousands and thousands of hours and sleepless nights trying to get this thing, um, this thing done. So, yeah, just look after yourself. Don't, don't push yourself. Be social. Do, do all the things a normal person still would do because those skills, even though you can't put them down in your CV, are super hireable as well. Like, just being a person who can make friends and things like that is, is, is still worth your time doing. So don't hide yourself in a corner and go, oh, I must make my portfolio the best it's ever been, because at the end of the day, if, you're, if your social skills are you know, not as good because you've been in a room for the last 10 years, then no one's going to hire you still. So yeah, look after yourself. Um, yeah, so in summary, try everything. Um, try and find the thing that you love the most, uh, and then if you're doing something that you love, then you'll probably be really good at it. Um, start simple, clear, achievable goals on projects. Make your life a ton easier, and you'll have some nice finished things that you can show off. Uh, play games. The more games you play, the more inspiration that you'll have and the more kind of different ideas that you'll have, meaning your portfolio will be a ton more diverse, probably. You won't just be making first-person shooters. Um, pick your battles. Uh, don't waste your time trying to do something that you're not trying to be hired for. If you're a programmer, no one's going to look at your art skills and go, yes, he's a good programmer. Um, learn to present yourself as well. Super important. If you're the best person ever, best designer, whatever, you're going to struggle if you don't know how to present yourself. People just aren't going to give you the time, sadly. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you uh, very much for listening. Um, if you want to talk to me afterwards, afterwards or have any questions, then feel free to come up to me and ask. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's my Twitter handle. Um, and yeah, have a great day. Thanks for listening.